This is the final chapter, part four of the Vortex Supercharged FRS slash BRZ review. This is the final chapter, the finale, what everybody wants to see, how the car performs on the track and the durability of the vehicle. We're gonna cover vendor support, longevity, drivability, and the braking system. And it's everything all tied up into one and there's not gonna be any more parts after this, thank God. We're here in glorious Michigan to do the photo shoot with Automobile Magazine. They probably won't like it. What? I'm just talking to the camera. What are you talking about? Hey. I'm just doing narration stuff. What are you talking about? I, I just talk about how amazing I am. <laughs> I'm in the car with Chris from Automobile Magazine. Chris is exploring and showing me the beauty of the Michigan roads. Uh, and I thought Illinois roads were bad, but this is breaking records today. Uh, Chris is driving around the car, gonna give his impressions and uh, hopefully we'll check it out in uh, one of the future versions of Automobile Magazine. I'm sure it'll be explosive, isn't that right? Let's hope it doesn't explode. <laughs> <laughs> the bypass <laughs> valve blowing. Awesome. Look at this. Yeah. I might, I might bail. Who knows? I've done launch control a million times, but yeah, Scion FRS. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> It's VSC Sport and traction control off, but I think it just, it was like, no, I... Doesn't yeah, like it. I didn't like that. So we're here at Automobile Magazine. We're finishing up the photo shoot, and uh, this gentleman is, you want to introduce yourself? Chris Nelson, road test editor for Automobile Magazine. So now you've driven both stock and this modified version. How do you compare them both, if you were just going to compare them both side by side? Uh, God, it's hard because, I mean, there are things I disliked about our long-term BRZ, but at the end of the day, it was still one of the most fun cars we ever had in. Anytime I got in it, it was like an old pair of gym shoes. I never had to think about driving it. It was just so simple. And so your car uh, irons out some of those wrinkles. Um, you know, gives me a little more straight line speed. The grip in the tires, which, I mean, we changed out, but yours, if I had to drive a car every day, this would be a pretty damn good car to drive. Okay. But even talking to you, you're still ironing out wrinkles that you're not happy with. So it's just interesting to see that progression where I go back to the stock BRZ, pretty damn happy with that car. You're, and I'm really happy with your car, and yet you're still not all the way there. It's just one of those things, tuning, you know? Yep. So. And that's a good lead-in point to check out uh, the issue of Automobile that will be coming out soon that will deal with some of this and a hell of a lot more. So have, fun, have fun on the track tomorrow, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate all the all time. Right. We've mounted the RPF1s to the vehicle. I have a spare wheel now. And we also have the AP racing brakes installed. Now the beauty of it is we're saving 16 pounds over the stock wheels with the RPF1s. 
with the AP Racing brakes, we're saving 20 pounds. So that's a total of 36 pounds of unsprung weight that we're going to save. And that's very helpful. But the problem is, oh, hand me that wheel. Problem is, is the supercharger weight uh, is somewhere in the 45 pound range, maybe even more with oil cooler. So we're not really getting any true weight reduction, but we're getting the unsprung weight. And I'm just doing some curls here because uh, it's gonna help me go to the bathroom when I'm done with this. So you ran about 40 minutes. What percent, how were you 100%, 80%, 90%? probably 80% for the first half, and then gradually picked up, trying to, to max pick, it up. Yeah, and the checkered flag never came out, so it was harder and harder and harder, and then I ran out of gas almost. So we're here at Autobahn Country Club in Juliet, Illinois, uh, and this fine gentleman uh, would like to introduce yourself. If you want. I'm uh, Peter Jankowskis. What, uh, where, what's your background in cars? Where did you come from? Well, uh, it basically started before I was born. Uh, my mother was pregnant with me up at the June Sprints as a spectator, and I grew up with all sorts of race cars and fast cars around me. Uh, we had a 67 GTO uh, growing up. Uh, my dad had that. We had a 62 Corvette. Uh, Pontiac uh, GTA Trans Am, uh, and then slowly I acquired a few more toys uh, over the years. Uh, okay. okay. So cut back in, uh, Trans Am, where, okay, so where, what else? Uh, well, let's see, uh, the kit cars uh, uh, from Factory 5, they're Daytona Coupe, uh, the Cobra Roadster, uh, also a, a Lola T70 Coupe replica, a Lister Corvette replica, and then a you know, Corvette, Subaru WRX STI, yeah, a lot of fun cars. Okay. What do you drive daily now? I drive a Honda Odyssey minivan. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Living large. Yeah, nice. It's probably faster than that for us. Uh, no, but I don't think not, so. Yeah, maybe not anymore. Um, so how did you get into Spec Racer Ford? Just... Uh, well, it, it came about through a number of circumstances. I, I was certainly aware of them when they first launched in the mid-80s. I remember seeing them at the LA Car Show thinking, boy, that'd be cool and watch him over the years. and. Oddly enough, I uh, came out here to California, I started racing at an indoor go-kart track, and the manager of the track, his father, raced Spec Racer Fords, and he introduced me to Bo Martin at Elite Autosport, and the rest is history. So now I have a car that 
Scott's helped me with and now Peter's helped me with, and I really appreciate it. So I just wanted to ask you uh, what, just being out on the track with the car, what your impressions were overall for a, kind of a street car on the track. I was very impressed overall with how forgiving the car was in, in terms of inputs. Uh, it responded to adjustments mid-corner very well. Um, I think even with the supercharger power, uh, they clearly designed it extremely well in terms of its ability to, to respond gracefully. Uh, I think, if anything, the car could even take even more power without much difficulty at all. Okay. In terms of braking stability, braking feel, I mean, obviously... The, the, brakes, the brakes were very impressive. Uh, you can definitely tell it's a very lightweight car. Uh, it stops extremely well and changes direction extremely well for a street car. Okay. And then I'll go on to you, since you just were out there in the last session, probably pushed it a whole lot harder than I did. What, were, what did you think overall? Compared to, compared to our track day engine. <clears throat> needs more power. Does it really? Still, yeah, <laughs> still really too slow. Well, you, you gotta be able to turn the opposite lock when you go around the turns. Oh, okay. I don't right. get any of that. It's too, it's too predictable. It's too predictable? Okay, well, I guess so. I like a little bit of a handful. Well, yeah. like, a, like an indoor go-kart. I'm used to that kind of power. Yeah, that's, that's extreme power. <laughs> so in terms of balance and everything, do you, do you think it needs anything different done? Or is this kind of like a good balance between street it feels and Very good. Okay. Um, I, I think I would recommend driving it some more uh, and really decide what it is you think it needs. Right now, I think we're well inside the envelope. We haven't really gotten to the edge yet to know what it would benefit most from. But right, two, like I say, it is days. very, very forgiving. Um, I would leave the suspension as it is and just keep driving it harder and harder and see what develops. Okay. See when you start spinning. You know, that, <laughs> that'll tell you what you need to do. Okay. Well, fair enough. And I think on that note, uh, I really appreciate Peter and uh, Scott helping me out with this project. And if you're watching this, I hope you learned something aside from, uh, I don't know. Just buy a race car to start with. It's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. If you're going to choose the, the Vortec kit specifically, I would choose Perrin mainly because they were involved right from the start of when this kit was manufactured. The second reason is, is Perrin actually owns the car and Jeff drives it almost daily with the Vortec kit on it. That cannot be said for any other tuner. Now while Tony from FA20 Club does own the car, um, he doesn't spend a lot of time with it, he spends more time with his customers' cars. So Perrin is a really, really good shop in terms of manufacturing. They're excellent in support, but they don't have a ton of time for tuning. Uh, so if you're considering something else other than the Vortec kit, you may want to talk with them just so you get on the same page before you do anything. This is the fluid collection. Of course, I wouldn't normally change all of this again because it's already been done, but uh, after this track date, it's probably a great idea after the amount of hours we put on. Diff fluid, manual trans fluid, coolant, engine oil, brake fluid, supercharger oil. One of the things after this track day that's kind of important, at least to me, is getting an oil sample collected to send out to Blackstone just to see if the uh, Redline oil has got any wear materials or heavy wear materials like bearing wear and stuff like that. So we know if the supercharger and the, the pressure of the kit is causing accelerated wear on any components. This is just dropping down the drain line from the supercharger. It actually fits without taking the bottom plate off. So you just remove the plug and then it just starts pissing out the supercharger oil, which Scott thinks is some type of um, synthetic type of trans fluid. So this is nice because it's a pain in the ass to have to change this fluid every 7,500 miles, but at least it's pretty easy to do. Now we've showed you how to drain the Vortec kit. This is how you fill it up. They give you a little bottle, like so, with a little nipple on it. And you can either use the, this is the uh, dipstick plug, this is the vent plug, so you can fill it in either one, but you just stick this bottle in there and then just squeeze it in. Um, and that's all there is to it. And then you keep it about half full on the dipstick level, which you're supposed to screw in all the way to check. It's right about it.
Yes. Ah! <laughs> that's what I didn't want to do. Oh, you didn't get that much on the floor. Oh my god, you can dump some of that out. I know. <laughs> So uh, we just drained the manual trans fluid out. This is the Pentosin, uh, and it looks bad. Uh, the cars had it in there for 12,000 miles, and I would say about, actually probably 13,000 miles now, and I would say maybe 12,000 of those miles have been really light. And I don't shift hard, I don't do any hard launches, and this shit looks bad and it smells bad. So I'm going to send out this fluid as well for analysis and see uh, what the hell's going on here. All over my fucking hair, bro. Hi. <laughs> Next is the diff. Looks good. I want some of this on my hand to throw a curveball. <laughs> right in my fucking dome. How's the drain plug right here? How much do you need I don't know. I don't remember. So finally, our, one of our last checks was just checking the catch can, and this is the radium catch can on the PCV line. And you can see there's probably a good, I really don't know how much is in there, but there's enough oil in here for one track day that you don't want it going back in the intake manifold, that much I can say. So Vortec, we started off with the install, and it wasn't pretty, to be honest, but we wanted to show a real world example of what it was like to do forced induction on this car. I've tested this for over four and a half months now, track, autocross, and street driving. Our initial complaints, I've talked to Brian from Vortec and their engineering department about every single issue I had. And what they're doing is they're actually making manufacturing improvements on the in intercooler tubes. Uh, they're changing brackets. They're overhauling the documentation. So basically, they've heard everything we've had to say and the forums and the people that have similar problems, and they're, they're taking action. So I would say I would recommend this kit for a couple reasons. One, in my case, I'm running a very conservative setup, and it's good for track and street, and I've had no problems. Secondly, uh, when I talk about overhead, I just got out of a 300 plus horsepower version or a Vortec kit on a car and it's a complete rocket. The power is there if you want it and if you want to dial it back you can do that as well. The third issue is tuning. Almost everybody that has an Accutech license or is an Accutech master tuner can easily tune for the Vortec kit. It's simple to tune for. You have intercooling, you have semi-accurate intake air temperature sensor. Uh, and it's, it's a linear power band, so there's not a lot of surprises to deal with. Um, it's easier than tuning for turbo, and it's way easier than tuning for the Innovate kit. Lastly, their manu uh, Vortex manufacturing and support is all in the U.S. They can make manufacturing changes on the fly easily. They have the resources to do it, and in, at the end of the day, they're a supercharger company. Uh, that's all they do. You're good. So uh, Scott's putting the tray back on, the underbody tray. Now one of the screws is broken off into the frame, so that'll be another treasure. Uh, but we, we're trying to chase down a vibration that we had on the track under left-hand turns and only left-hand turns. It sounded like a, a vibration, like something was rubbing or exhaust was rubbing on metal. But we couldn't find anything, and it's impossible to check without the suspension being fully loaded. So. So I guess we're just going to get a Dodge Caliber and call it a day.